others would sing in church, and his good voice got him noticed. Encouraged by the attention and the money he could earn, 12-year-old Dick also sang at the local synagogue and Masonic Lodge. By 1923, Dick had become a talented musician and singer, and his life was a carefully devised balancing act. The liberal arts major at Little Rock College paid the rent as a part-time telephone installer and was the leader of the hot campus dance band. For an ambitious and confident guy like Dick Powell, a dance band was the greatest thing in the world. It put him in the spotlight, and it was a fine way to meet the most desirable ladies Little Rock had to offer. On May 28, 1925, one of them became his wife. Mildred Mond was a pretty girl from a wealthy Texas family who hoped her new husband would settle down and get a nice job close to home. But Dick saw better opportunity on the road and dropped out of school to play conventions and club dates in Arkansas and Missouri. His timing couldn't have been better. It was the Roaring Twenties. The music was jumping, the booze was illegal. Girls bobbed their hair and shortened their dresses, shucking the restrictions of the Victorian era and experimenting with a new social freedom. Young people kicked up their heels to the music of Paul Whiteman, Hoagie Carmichael, and Red Nichols. Band leaders were the biggest celebrities around, and Dick's charisma and vitality made him a standout. In 1925, he joined the popular Charlie Davis Band, and before long, the group was cutting their own records, featuring Dick as lead crooner. As much as Mildred hated life on the road, her husband loved it. The canny performer saw music as his future, and there was no turning back. On the night of October 6, 1927, talking pictures arrived. Movies became not only a feast for the eyes, but also a feast for the ears. Al Jolson's The Jazz Singer had sparked a revolution. And almost overnight, Hollywood was on the hunt for actors with beautiful faces and melodious voices. Live entertainment was taking a back seat to the thriving motion picture business. The vaudeville theaters where Dick often played were being converted into plush movie palaces. Dick's commanding stage presence got him the job of Master of Ceremonies at the glamorous Enright Theater in Pittsburgh where he led the band, played tenor saxophone, and introduced such touring movie stars as Pola Negri, Buddy Rogers, and Gene Harlow. He was very hard worker. He always had things on the fire. He always seemed to be in good humor. He gave the impression of always enjoying what he was doing. The tireless performer also hosted a weekly radio show called The Pow Wow Club. Nearly 90% of Steeltown listened in. I think Dick was surprised by all of the adulation and uh, maybe a little bit embarrassed. After all, he was this country boy from northern Arkansas who now was the center of attention in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So I think he was a little amazed, <laughs> amazed by it all but not affected. His hat size stayed the same. By now, Dick Powell was a Hollywood prospect, and in 1931, a Warner Brothers talent scout offered the 27-year-old a trip to Tinseltown and a chance at a screen test. But Dick's wife, Mildred, was fed up with his prodigal ways and told him that if he went west, she would not go with him. With nothing but his suitcase and his talent, Dick headed to California deciding that his career was more promising than his marriage. After a successful screen test, Powell's first movie assignment for Warners was tailor-made. He was cast as a band leader in Blessed Event, starring Lee Tracy and Mary Bryan. It was just like you step out one door and into another, because musicals were coming into their own. He was just ripe for this. All the world around is clover bound on that honeymoon express. How can you say no when all the world is saying yes? He had all of the stage presence, 
and professional experience when he came out, although pictures were new to him. He just took it like a duck to water. Where is this public nuisance who announced he would be here in spite of anything we could do to keep him out? Oh, ladies and gentlemen, I ask you, where is Alvin Roberts? So impressed were the studio brass when Powell received 20,000 letters from his loyal Pittsburgh fans that even before the movie was completed, he was offered a six-month contract for $500 a week. Taking advantage of his growing celebrity, the studio publicity mill made sure that whenever Dick Powell and Mary Bryan were out together, their picture would appear in the gossip magazines with hints that they were on the fast track to marriage. We used to go dancing. Both of us loved to dance, and the band leaders down at the Coconut Grove always knew him or wanted to know him. He was charming, charming fellow, and we became very good friends, and because we were neighbors, saw a lot of each other. Powell was running with a fast crowd at hot spots like the Brown Derby, Ciro's, and the Coconut Grove. He wasted no time capitalizing on his connections from his MC days, using his wit and charm to get close to Hollywood's movers and shakers. But when a glut of mediocre musical fare kept audiences out of the theaters, the young performer, so recently in demand, was all dressed up with nowhere to go. The once popular and profitable musical film was on the way out, and it seemed Dick Powell's career was about to go with it. I need full power. Turbos! Every weekday, Jan Michael Vincent and Ernest Borgnine take to the skies. Now that's brilliant! Airwolf, weekdays at 2 p.m. In lavish quantities, 200 beautiful girls were picked for more than 5,000 applicants. Spectacular dance routines set to the rhythm of inspiring music in scenes never before attempted on stage or screen. In 1933, Busby Berkeley revolutionized talking pictures by combining dazzling cinematic techniques with the best Broadway had to offer. 42nd Street radically changed the course of the Hollywood musical and breathed new life into Dick Powell's career. Berkeley cast Powell as a secondary lead and teamed him up with the popular tap dancer, Ruby Keeler. The pairing worked instantly. Dick was in the right place at the right time, as were other performers of those days who had the good fortune to be in a Busby Berkeley musical. Powell's good timing got him cast again with Keeler in Berkeley's next film. Gold Diggers of 1933 co-starred one of Warner Brothers' biggest stars, Joan Blondell, with whom Dick quickly became involved. Blondell, a high-spirited comedian and veteran of 25 films, found herself in financial difficulty after her recent divorce and was also raising a two-year-old son on her own. When Powell offered to help her, their friendship blossomed into romance. She said she was taken with the kindness and gentleness that, uh, that uh, he exhibited toward her and the fact that uh, he really seemed to love me. And I think that's what attracted her to him more than any other thing that I can remember. Powell found continued success as a supporting player in a string of musicals, each as lighthearted as the one before it. Joan Blondell, Ruby Keeler, and Dick Powell in Busby Berkeley's musical extravaganza, Footlight Parade. Announcing the coming of Wonder Bar. Warner Brothers' mightiest musical attraction. With 15 big stars. When the lovely dance is over, don't stay. By 1934, the Powell Keeler team was one of the nation's most popular song and dance duos, second only to Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers. Success bred confidence, 
and the 29-year-old felt ready to tackle bigger roles. But his boss, Jack Warner, knew a good thing when he saw it and ordered Dick to stick with his current assignments. Nonetheless, the movie mogul did allow Powell a starring role in Hollywood Hotel, a radio variety program featuring gossip columnist Luella Parsons and singer Francis Langford. Dick was the MC, and people liked him just as he was. <laughs> and I don't blame him. He was, he was a nice guy, just as sweet as he could be. And all the time, not just once in a while, you know. Hollywood Hotel. The extravagant floor show is headed by Warner Brothers' bright young star, Dick Powell, as master of ceremonies. Hi, boss. Hello, Dorothy. Uh, oh. Say, say, did you see that crowd of customers rolling in? Looks like a big night for the orchid room. Everything all set, boss? All the performing seals in? You're the last one, Mr. Powell. Yeah, last as usual. Powell's popularity had peaked when he made the list of the top ten box office stars of 1935. But his partnership with Keeler, which had made him a success, had also left him typecast. Powell hoped that his loan out to 20th Century Fox for the starring role in the sophisticated comedy Thanks a Million would show he could carry a film on his own. Sally, guess what's happened? I know all about it. Eric, you've got to do it. But what about New York? That's exactly what I'm thinking of. You haven't a ghost of a chance of being elected governor, but you'll get a publicity break that will make you. But how? Did you ever hear of radio? Radio? Certainly. But I don't know what good making a political speech on the radio is going to do me. Sweetheart, you're not only going to speak, you're going to sing. Sing? And you're going to get a big radio hookup all oh, your I won't run, run for, for governor. governor. <laughs> oh, Sally, you are without a doubt the most remarkable woman I've ever known. Say, Ned, go in and put it up to him. Tell him that they'll give me a big radio hookup and a chance to sing one song with every speech I make, it's a deal. Otherwise, no dice. I'm sitting high on a hilltop Tossing all my troubles to the moon Where the breeze seems to say Don't you worry Things are bound to pick up pretty soon After devoting so much energy to his career Dick wanted to pay some attention to his personal life He moved his parents from Arkansas Into a beautiful North Hollywood home But his next change made headlines On September 19th, 1936 Dick Powell married Joan Blondell aboard the luxury liner Santa Paula, and the newlyweds took a cruise south of the border and through the Panama Canal to New York for their honeymoon. Hollywood's newest couple ended their trip with a massive publicity event in New York City. In the midst of the day's thrills and excitement, the little screen star has just the word for her public. I got him, girl. <laughs> the outgoing and effervescent actress was every inch the movie star, and quite a contrast to Dick's stay-at-home first wife, Mildred. To Blondell's delight, her new husband adopted her young son, Norm. With a ready-made family to support, the busy actor focused on buying, fixing up, and selling homes at a profit, as well as concentrating on his acting career. I think he was career obsessed, and I think uh, in order to succeed, it was necessary to, uh, to be career obsessed. But uh, they did a pretty good job of letting me have a relatively ordinary childhood. The success of Fox's Thanks a Million prompted the studio to ask for Powell again this time for their 1937 backstage musical On the Avenue. The sophisticated comic farce co-starred the vivacious Madeline Carroll, and the music was by Powell's childhood hero, Irving Berlin. Miss Carley, something tells me you didn't like the performance tonight. I'll arrange to get your money back at the box office. You impudent upstart! Now, I'll tell you what you are. You're about the poorest sport I ever had the misfortune to bump into. Well, I haven't begun to tell you what I think of you. For two cents, I'd cut your face. You've already done that. The next year brought Hollywood Hotel, an all-star extravaganza based on Powell's popular radio show. Hooray for Hollywood! That's who we bally who be Hollywood! Many of us for you young mechanic can be a panic with just a good-looking hand. But by now, musicals had run their course, 
and Powell found himself relegated to uninspired B pictures, sometimes with Ronald Reagan. On June 30th, 1938, the Powell family celebrated the birth of a daughter, Ellen. With a growing family to support, Dick felt he should be getting a better deal from his home studio. Marching into Jack Warner's office, Powell told the powerful mogul that he wanted more money and better assignments, and that went for his wife, too. Jack Warner said no. At the risk of being blacklisted, Dick walked away from Warner Brothers and took Joan Blondell, one of the studio's biggest stars, with him. Well, she had a lot of faith in him as, a, as an actor, and she thought that uh, he should have better pictures, better stories and directors. It was a gutsy move that cost the couple almost a year's wages, but Dick felt this was a calculated risk worth taking. On his own for the first time in Hollywood, Powell found freelance work in non-musical films, including Preston Sturgis's satirical comedy, Christmas in July. I've just won the $25,000 first prize in the Max House contest. <laughs> what would you do if you won $25,000? Wouldn't you bring happiness to all your friends and neighbors? But just suppose the whole thing was a mistake. Can we see the faces on everybody when we get out there? Yeah. Like Christmas in July. Dick also co-starred with his wife, Joan, in such romantic vehicles as I Want a Divorce and Model Wife. But these lightweight movies were as unsatisfying to the Powells as they were to audiences and critics, and their failure put a strain on the marriage. To Powell, it seemed that his career was in free fall when he found himself relegated to third banana in the Abbott and Costello movie, In the Navy. It's laugh ahoy, my hearties, with a new comedy rage of the nation. Those gay, goofy, hilarious nitwits of the Navy, Bud Abbott and Lou Costello, in the Navy, aided by Dick Powell, in the merriest Navy musical that ever hit the screen. We're in the Navy now. Though the film opened to great success in 1941, Powell was unhappy in Hollywood and wondered if Broadway was the answer for both him and his wife. In New York, Joan's work prospects looked rosy when she met the dynamic producer of Broadway spectacles, Mike Todd, who set about wooing her to appear on The Great White Way. But as Joan spent more time with Todd and accepted his expensive gifts, Dick knew that he and Blondell were in trouble. With a stalled career and a struggling marriage, Dick Powell would need a lucky break. It would take a tough-talking detective and a beautiful young blonde to turn things around. CashNet USA is trusted by over two million customers. Perfect. When I'm 41, a date which will live in infamy. World War II put careers on hold for many of Hollywood's biggest stars as men signed up to join the fight. Now 37 and too old to be drafted, Powell did his part by entertaining the troops and raising money for United States war bonds. Hollywood starts its bond cavalcade with Dick Powell, Betty Hutton, and Louise LaPlante as three of the star salesmen. Buy bonds, says Betty Hutton, but buy them. While Hollywood's finest were overseas, top drawer studios like Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer needed fresh faces, and Dick was one of them. In 1944, he joined the cast of Meet the People. Featured in the sunny musical was an ingenue and rising star, June Allison. He said, oh, you're that little girl with that funny voice. And I said, yeah. He was wonderful to all of us new kids. If we had a problem, he would tell us how to do a scene or help us learn how to read a script. And our friendship just kind of grew. Powell's marriage to Joan Blondell, though still valid on paper, was all but over. And before long, Dick and June were more than friends. She was paying weekly visits to him aboard his yacht, Santana, and Hollywood insiders were buzzing about a Powell-Allison romance. The return of peace after the world's most devastating war. VJ Day, victory in the global conflict. When World War II ended, 
audiences responded to the gritty realism of a new type of filmmaking called film noir and older actors found themselves playing leading men. With Fred McMurray's success in Double Indemnity, 40-year-old Dick Powell saw a new opportunity. After RKO Studios snapped up the rights to Raymond Chandler's novel, Farewell, My Lovely, Dick lobbied hard for the lead role of a tough guy detective. But director Edward Dimitrick wasn't convinced that Powell was the man for the job. We had Clark Gable at the top of the list and Bogey and people like that that we knew we couldn't get because they were under contract at the studios. And Kerner, who was head of RKO, said, fellas, he said, I wish you would consider using Dick Powell in this role. And that was the first little bit of a shock. But he said, we want to, to hire him as a singer, but he won't sign a contract unless he can do a tough guy first. Powell saw his dreams realized when private detective Philip Marlowe hit the screen like gangbusters. <laughs> Before. What are the rates? As much as the traffic will bear. When can you start? I've already started. Well, this looks like something to rub your palms about. But my client's lovely stepdaughter had other ideas. What did she ask you to do? She wanted me to kiss her and find a jade necklace. Whatever she was willing to pay you, I'll up it. Just stay away from her. Forget the whole thing. It sounded screwy, but it's a funny thing. I always follow through on a sale, even if it pays dividends in a broken skull. I didn't see what hit me. I didn't have to. The first thing I knew, I found myself heaped on a bed like a bag of bones ready for the scrap heap. My throat was dry. My hands felt like a bunch of bananas. I couldn't stand on my pen. Okay, I said to myself, you're a tough guy. Let's see you get out of this straitjacket. Released in 1945, the film, now titled Murder My Sweet, was a runaway hit. The studio promoted the new tough Dick Powell, and the novelist who created the detective was equally impressed. Raymond Chandler loved the film, and he thought Dick Powell was the best uh, Philip Marlowe that he ever had. Murder My Sweet gave Dick Powell the top billing and critical acclaim he'd been longing for his entire movie career. And his newfound success made it easier to accept the failure of his marriage and turn up the heat on his long simmering romance with June Allison. Unaffected and innocent, the 26-year-old actress was a breath of fresh air for Powell and she had fallen head over heels in love with him. He never did ask me to marry him. I asked him. And he said, oh, no, you're, you're too young for me and I've been married and I want to get married again. I said, well, then I don't think we should see each other anymore. I said, okay, we'll get married. And he said, when do you think we should do this? I said, is next week too soon? June wasted no time asking MGM studio head Louis B. Mayer for permission to marry. On August 19th, 1945, Mayer gave the bride away in an informal ceremony at the home of a friend. I wanted to marry. I was so afraid if I took the time to have a gown made, I'd lose him. So I just wore my own gray suit. <laughs> After a brief honeymoon, Powell returned to work, determined to build upon his new image. He successfully re-teamed with director Dimitrik for another film noir drama entitled Cornered. He also took on the role of mentor, guiding his new bride's career and managing her business affairs. He was not a waster of money, and he was frugal, but he only would get the best of everything no matter how much it cost. When it came to expensive toys like boats and planes, Powell denied himself very little and believed that being successful meant using even his free time to make the most of business relationships. We both bought airplanes and we learned to fly together. And we used to go off sometimes into the desert to some stop, you know, for breakfast or something of that sort. He loved all those kind of things. And it also, he loved boating. When a man has a boat, that's really worse than having another woman or a mistress. Because men love their toys. When doctors told June she couldn't have children, the couple adopted a daughter, Pamela, on August 18, 1948. And two years later, 
The Powell surprised everyone, including themselves, when June became pregnant with their second child. Richard Jr. was born on Christmas Day. The proud father immediately set to work building a larger ranch estate for his growing family. And he also bought a new boat, the Sapphire Sea. He loved the Sapphire Sea. It was just a passion he had. I knew he worked long hours. I knew he worked about 18 hours. But when we spent time together as a family, it was quality time. But while Dick was working and playing hard, he once again found himself relegated to secondary roles in movies. In the meantime, his wife June had become a major star. In September of 1950, Powell paid close attention when RCA's chairman David Sarnoff trumpeted the arrival of a new medium called television. Newspapers, magazines, mail, and messages will be sent through the air at lightning speed and reproduced in the home. Although at this point primitive, the curious talking box called TV would lead Dick Powell to the most difficult and rewarding challenge of his career. The atomic bomb is one of the most powerful forces new entertainment medium called television. What many had written off as a passing fad quickly threatened to topple the studios. More people were buying televisions and theater ticket sales plummeted. Yet Dick Powell saw a business opportunity he could not ignore one that would allow him to become a mogul in his own right. Early dramatic television was married to sound stages in New York, claustrophobic interiors shot under harsh studio lights. But Powell's approach was to bring the glitz and glamour of Hollywood into America's living rooms. In 1952, he formed a production company called Four Star. It teamed fellow actors who believed the fad of TV had a future. Crystal Myers Four Star Playhouse presents Charles Boyer, Dick Powell, David Niven, Ida Lupino. Behind the scenes, Powell recruited the best production talent, including a young writer named Aaron Spelling, whom Dick affectionately called Skinny. I don't think I've ever, ever met anyone and really have my life changed so completely because he was my mentor he was my father image the one thing he said to me over and over skinny i'm not a writer i'm counting on you and the other people on the shows what more could you ask for that's that that was the honesty of the man from out of the west dick powell's same gray theater Dick Powell brought television viewers the great American West in all its glory, with sprawling cinematic vistas that weren't possible back in New York's television studios. Each episode featured a different movie star, such as Jack Lemmon, Edward G. Robinson, and Dean Jones, and the show soared in the ratings. Anchoring each program with a familiar star allowed Powell to develop the anthology format a series of dramas with no recurring characters and different stories each week. We're going to town, Brad. Afraid you'll have to walk. I only brought one horse. How far? How far do I walk? That depends on you. To the woods? To the stream? He believed in anthologies. Everybody said they'll never work. Well, as far as I knew, they were the best company of their time. The success of these programs encouraged Powell to tackle controversial subject matter. One show took the bold step of casting an African-American in a leading role. Start talking. Send us the Comanche. You can go free. We're taking him to the fort. You are fools to die for a land that does not want you. He was open to your enthusiasm. And very often, I think he let us do things that he didn't get and didn't think were going to work. And when they did work, he applauded us. Dick also created an anthology show to capitalize on his wife's fame as a movie star. It was fun to do. I actually did one out of every four. We did one a week, but I did all the intros. Good evening. Our story, Summer's Ending. Starring with me, Mr. Dick Powell. I just thought I'd let you know that I'm leaving on the first flight in the morning. 
Your wife will hear about me. Enid will see to it. Oh, I'm going to tell her myself. What would you tell her? That I just met the girl I should have married. With Four Star, Powell was able to maximize every facet of his experience as a savvy businessman, director, producer, and actor. And he often added a personal touch by hosting many of his shows. When television was in its infancy, the networks were frantically looking for a performer who could really get it rolling. The star of our play this week did much more than that. He won, and richly deserved, the title of Mr. Television. Of course, I'm talking about Milton Berle. Ever since I was 16, I've been telling myself, tomorrow's just got to get better. Maybe it will. Sure. The day the police finally decide they don't approve of this place. Do you think I enjoy pumping action on that table like a two-bit peasant? Then walk away from it, Eddie. To what? Some job where I'll see Sandy a quick hour a night and count pennies to buy her a new toy? Is no, that what thanks. you're going to tell Sandy when she finds out what kind of a place this is? Oh, look, Chris, you've got some funny ideas. You're not Sandy's mother, remember that. Sandy's mother is dead. Eddie! So don't worry so much about her. I take care of her fine. Eddie, please! And if you don't like the way I do that, you can find your big tomorrow some other place. <laughs> But for an ambitious overachiever like Dick Powell, running the most successful television company in town wasn't enough. Beginning in 1956, he also directed and produced a string of tough guy feature films, such as The Conqueror, starring John Wayne, and in 1958, two compelling war dramas, The Hunters and The Enemy Below. I want you to meet Wendell Mays. Hello? Mr. Mays has just written one of the most powerful screenplays I've ever read, based on the novel, The Enemy Below. It's the story of a duel to the death between two men, an American destroyer captain, played by Robert Mitchum, and a German submarine commander, played by the great European star, Kurt Jurgens. Pretty hard for one ship to surprise them. Their commander might be able to knock us off if he's smart enough. I wonder what sort of man he is. I have no idea what he is, or what he thinks. I don't want to know the men I'm trying to destroy. By 1960, however, Dick Powell knew that television provided him the fiscal control and creative freedom he craved. He had become a major force in the new medium, and many of his programs are fondly remembered, such as The Rifleman, starring Chuck Connors. Powell's keen eye for fresh talent also opened doors for new actors who appeared on his series, including Mary Tyler Moore, Charles Bronson, Steve McQueen, Peter Falk, and Robert Redford. Law and morality, home the flag, and mother all say you can hit back because your old man happened to be this old man. What do you want out of me? Hail and farewell, Nick, and lots of proud journey. Well, what do you want me to say? That you've had your share of troubles? Okay, Pop, I'm sorry for you, I'm sorry. <laughs> Don't ever be sorry for me. Don't be sorry for me. Just leave me alone. Powell had transformed himself into a television mogul and a millionaire many times over. But his business obligations were crushing, and a punishing work schedule meant that he was rarely at home. He was a, a total workaholic. I think that was the fun of working with him. You have to be a workaholic when you're doing more than one show. I have to say that business truly was his life. He loved his family, but business was his, was his baby. The 57-year-old businessman was also making money buying and selling his homes, often without telling his wife first. I was really never included. He'd always pat me on the head and say, you don't have to worry your little head about this. I'll take care of it. And so he did. June respected Dick's strong ways, but after a decade and a half of marriage, she had grown up and was tired of being patronized. To Hollywood's surprise and Dick's shock, she filed for divorce in 1961, placing one of Hollywood's storybook marriages in jeopardy. Have you or a loved one had an Ethicon Physio Mesh Los Angeles courtroom? listening to his wife, June Allison, tell a judge how she wanted to end their marriage. I was at the school where you should have dinner with your children. They should be a part of, you know, a group, a family group. But he never got there. 
And when we went through this silly divorce thing, the big headline in paper called him the man who did not come to dinner. But while she felt he had taken her for granted in the relationship, she still loved Dick dearly and was ambivalent about breaking up. The more she spoke about wanting to end the marriage, the more it was apparent she wanted it to continue. The judge granted June a divorce and awarded her a settlement of two and a half million dollars. But Dick was of his own mind about the court's ruling. He was sitting at the little breakfast nook, having breakfast, reading the paper. And I said, what are you doing here? I, we just got a divorce. He said, no, you didn't. You just got a paper that said you can have a divorce in a year. And he said, you know, I'm never going to let you go. And you spent all that money for no reason at all. And went right on eating his breakfast. Didn't phase him at all. And we never did get the divorce, for which I'm very grateful. After the couple reconciled, June insisted Dick take the family on an all-fun, no-business vacation cruise down the coast of Mexico. I just said, you know, you don't spend any time with us. The children don't know you very well. And I think you have so much you can teach them, much more than I can teach them. And I think we should take a month or two off and just the four of us go. When the family returned from their vacation, Work associates noticed how fit and relaxed their boss seemed. But it was not to last. Dick Powell was seriously ill with cancer. I think he was very open about announcing it. It may have been even a stockholders meeting if this force started going public at that point in time. And he, uh, you know, he described uh, his condition in, uh, in, some, in some detail. I just refused to believe it. And he said, don't worry, Skinny, I'm going to beat that, this thing. And I believed him so much, I thought he would. He knew what he had. He pretended that he didn't have it, and I pretended that he didn't have it, too. That was a very strange situation between us. But soon the ravages of the advancing disease forced Dick to resign from the presidency of Four Star. It was a bitter blow for an executive whose life revolved around his work. On January 2nd, 1963, after a three-month struggle, 58-year-old Dick Powell died of cancer. It was probably the worst time of my life. I don't remember too much about it except complete aloneness. I didn't know how to handle it. I just, uh, I fell apart. All Hollywood gathered to express its shock and mourn the passing of one of the most easygoing and likable guys in town, as well as one of the most successful. Dick Powell was a charming presence in a string of now classic musicals. He displayed great range and versatility in roles from The Boy Next Door to a world-weary gumshoe. But as a producer of the highest order, he left his mark on television's creative process, becoming an innovator and inspiring a new generation. You can't replace Dick Powell. He was one of a kind, really one of a kind. He's, I will always say he was my mentor and father figure. There's nobody like him uh, before or since. Dick was an um, incredibly noble character. He was a strong man kind, gentle, and a, a very good father. He deserves a lot of recognition and a lot of love from everybody because he gave so much of himself to the world.